No, no, ma non funzionava nulla, adesso funziona. Dimmi da quando ho messo... So we can start the recording. Okay, so we can start. So it's uh, the new academic year for uh, for the courses, and it's still a pleasure to have you to uh, talk about uh, an introduction, we'll give an introduction to quantum integrability. Jules maybe maybe most of you know is working here at the IPRC and uh, is a uh, mathematical physicist uh, working in quantum integrability, many body systems, and so thanks a lot. By the way, so if you are from uh, outside the institute, we go for lunch after uh, the lectures, and uh, so just uh, stay at the entrance, we will give you some card that you can use at the canteen. Okay, thank you. All right, so thanks, and thanks for having me here, and thanks for showing up, uh, even though it's kind of maybe still holiday or maybe not. Um, I encourage any questions, especially from the uh, non-senior people, because uh, that's really the point of this course, that the people learn something about this topic, so it's meant to be very pedagogical and, and so on. Also, for people watching online, either live or later on, please uh, ask uh, or email me with questions uh, if you have them. So what I want to talk about is this and it looks kind of very technical and, and maybe it's a bit intimidating, certainly to me it was before I started working on it. So the point of the, the aim of these courses, this course is to give an introduction to kind of guide you kind of through this and, and give you a starting point to, to really appreciate why this is a very beautiful and, and, and nice area and where kind of maybe the physical intuition uh, comes from in, in, in some sets of uh, problems. And, and that should be a good starting point if you later on would be interested to continue really working on it or just uh, for general interest. So what I want to start with is just some general kind of context of why this is an interesting topic uh, if you're not already working on it. And before I go there, let's, let's start with, okay, so this notion of quantum integrability um, is not really well defined. It's a kind of a vague name, but I think, um, the way that I want to think about it is it, it, it is a, the study of models that come from physics, from theoretical physics. Um, with some underlying um, quantum algebraic. structure. Okay, so models coming from physics that are somehow mathematically very nice. And this this is a bit, uh, we will get there. So what, what this quantum algebraic is, it is, uh, we will slowly start to see uh, during these lectures. It is in, in terms of mathematics, it's related to representation theory, and in particular of things called quantum groups, which were developed in, in part because of this uh, field. But physically, the, the consequences of these, this underlying structure 
is that such models have many symmetries and they are exactly solvable in some sense. So they have exact analytic methods to study things of physical, quantities of physical interest. And so for me, quantum integrable models form a, a subset of more generally exact solvable, so exact solvability. And the, the idea that happens here is that if you're working on a the model, then you might be very clever and somehow come up with a way to solve this, and describe exactly energies or, or things like this. So you might somehow be able to find an exact solution to the model, whatever that precisely means. But that doesn't really give you great understanding. Quantum integrability is one layer deeper. It gives, it really comes with an algebraic structure, which is very rich, and this allows you to get this exact solvability. So it kind of, it not, doesn't only give you the, the exact answer for what you're looking for, but it also tells you why you have this answer. And so it's a really rich structure. It's also a little bit ad hoc. I mean, you, if, if you give me a model, I will probably, it will be hard to see whether or not it's quantum integrable. I can put it in the computer and if I'm lucky, then some of these vis symmetries are really visible in the spectrum, but not, that's not even necessarily so. So it's not obvious a priori which models would be quantum integrable and which ones are not. But rather it's kind of like something that once you see it and it works, then you know slowly you might be able to develop an understanding of why it works and so on. And that's really what we do in quantum integrable systems. Uh, and I will I will ex kind of illustrate this today in the coming uh, lectures in explicit models and how historically people kind of first found some results and then how slowly it was understood what the underlying mathematical structure was. And um, sorry. Um, how, how generic is this uh, quantum integrability structure? In the sense that for, for symmetries, you know, we, we can just look at the, just, just for standard symmetries, we can look at the symmetries of a model that somewhat constrains, say, the Lagrange and then blah, blah, and then, you know, we, uh, we still have some separate dynamics and so on. So, uh, so can you do the same with the, this sort of one? Clarify. What I mean here by symmetries is not just that you have like SO3 symmetry or so, but really what I want is I want lots of Hamil commuting Hamiltonians. So I, was just, I want kind of momentum to be conserved, energies to be conserved, higher kind of quantities of this type to be conserved. So, so sometimes we call this a hierarchy or a tower or a big family. Hierarchy. It's all a bit hard. Of Hamiltonians. So there are really lots and lots of symmetries, and in some sense, there should be maximally many symmetries. And in the quantum case, this is not, it's a little bit of work to really properly characterize what maximally many means. So it's actually easier to kind of say which underlying structure you want. And then from that, we will get lots of uh, such uh, symmetries. Um, yes, I know. So it's really kind of, I want, so basically what I'm saying is there's a particular area of mathematics which interplays extremely nicely with a particular, with, with different parts of very special models in physics. And integrability is really the structure of this relation. And um, we will get there. I mean, this is a bit vague now, but uh, you know, I will have to give lots of examples to really show what, what I'm talking about. So that will be the point of the talk. Yeah, I, I guess the question was, um... I mean, I can understand that you can have some very, very special models which have uh, a lot of symmetry, maximum symmetry, and whatever. That's, that's very good and it's, it's, it's nice. But uh, can, can you use this to characterize somewhat more generic models? Right. So the idea or maybe with some uh, weakly broken whatever. So in, in I, I don't know. The so this depends on the model. In some cases, the model is kind of, the integrability is kind of robust in the sense that you can perturb away from it and integrability can be a very good kind of starting point and you can really. Uh, use this to understand a bit kind of like an area uh, kind of of this model in, in kind of model space. Other models that are integrable are much more special and delicate. And as soon as you vary things, often you kind of completely break, break this structure. So the structure, it can be very delicate. However, the idea is that, as you know, I mean, there, so if you're lucky, then in each universality class, you have an integrable model and you use it to study universal properties. In fact, as I will kind of, well, um, 
the, the whole idea of universality, so that there might be models that have parameters and the physics doesn't really depend on the, the values of these parameters, comes from an integrable model, namely the 2D Ising model. So then people realize like, oh, this is actually, if you compute thermodynamic quantities, it does not depend on kind of the ratio of two uh, coupling. So it's universal. So this was really an important theoretical step. And then later on, there was another model, um, the eight vertex model, which has a different universality class. So also the idea of universality classes come from integrable models. So integrable models really allow you, they're very important theoretical. They might be special, but they're really important to study. You know, at least there are some points that you can really study in great detail and really learn a lot. Um, so this was historically extremely important. And moreover, if you want to learn about phase transitions or universality classes, then you know you can try to find an integrable model in the class that you're looking at, study that, and that's the idea of how they might be useful more broadly. I will talk about okay. other kind of real world applications of integrable models later on. So even though they're very special, some of them are actually realistic and occur in nature or can be built in the lab. And we'll see that in a moment as well. Okay, thank you. All right. So historically, and we were kind of talking about this already a little bit. So the, historically, um, there are, in my opinion, but uh, I'm happy for experts to uh, protest, there are four main categories of these type of models. So four different kind of settings in theoretical physics where integrable models appear. Um, so the first one, well, okay, this is the first one because um, the first word there, happened. So they're called quantum spin chains. So they're quantum mechanical models. They are one plus one dimensional uh, lattice models, so discrete states, and they're quantum mechanical. And one key model here is the um, Heisenberg spin chain. And that will be the topic of today. And some key names of people that worked on it. Um, so I'll try blue, but tell me if blue is either unreadable or too close to white. So the first person who worked on this is Beta. I haven't seen it yet, but I understand that he also appeared in the Oppenheimer movie, because he was certainly very important in that program, historically, and he was a great physicist. One of the many different things that he did is take a model, solve it, and this was really the start of the field. And then he went on to do lots of other stuff, but somehow he really gave one of the great impulse, impulses to this field. Um, then. Other people that worked on it that were quite important were Young and Young. And the first of these two, if you put them in alphabetic order in their first name, uh, is the Young from Young Mills. Um, then there's also Fadiev, which you might from Fadiev Popov goes. Um, and then maybe a bit less famous outside of the field are Jimbo and Miwa in Japan. And certainly I should mention here Godin who is the, was, was the French superstar from, from our lo local, uh, from here, of course. So these are people that really developed a lot of this uh, theory and were very important. So everybody at the big school of people, Rashidi came, Rinsfeld, many other people came from there. So this is sometimes called the Leningrad School. This is called the Kyoto School. So Japan also has a lot of very good people in the field. Um, all right, so this is one kind of, this is the earliest direction. And then a little bit later, the second field came from lattice models, where, I mean, spin chains are also lattice models. So let me clarify that now. I mean, two dimensional lattice, no time, but, um, statistical mechanics, classical statistical mechanics. And so they're lattice, of course, also lattice models. And some models that are uh, quite famous in this class, well, there's the easing model, uh, to the easing from square lattice. Um, I put this in parentheses, it's certainly very important, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so the types of models which I will talk about are called ice type models, or sometimes the six vertex model. And another one I already mentioned is eight vertex model. And these are really the ones that were super important historically for the development of the idea of universality, universality classes, and so on. People that are famous that worked on this kind of stuff are uh, Lee, uh, Sutherland, and Baxter from Australia. So 
they were very important working mostly on this type of models. Now let me continue on this side. The third class are quantum many body systems. They are also one plus one dimensional, like these spin chains, but they have continuous phase rather than lattice. They're again quantum mechanical. And um, some famous models of this type are the Lieb Linear or um, Delta Bose gas, is it Delta Bose? Uh, and another one is the Calogero Sutherland or Calogero Moser Sutherland. Models and as the name suggests, or Leap was important here, and Sutherland was very important here, and well, of course, also Calogero, but I want to highlight these two guys. And then the, the fourth kind of pillar, which was also very important, is quantum field theory. Again, one plus one dimensional, uh, of course, continuous, of course, quantum mechanical. And a very important example here is Singe Gordon. And this was, among others, was studied by the Zamalochikovs. I'm not going to write it twice, so unlike Yang Yang, so I'll just square them. Um, and also Fadir uh, and, and many other people. And this was historically, they were important to kind of develop ideas in quantum field theory more generally. So kind of like uh, how, how you um, uh, renormalize all these kind of like techniques because this model is exactly solvable, so you can really kind of develop it and understand whether it works and how to do it and so on. Um, so, okay. So what I, well, then let me just mention that this is historically where these models appear. But then, of course, so this is in the first, uh, let's say up to the, um, the 80s or something, people mostly studied this. And then later on, it was actually realized. So you see that these settings are quite, they might quite be quite unrelated. Classical statistical mechanical models, quantum mechanical lattice or continuous models, quantum field theories. Somehow, integrability appears in all of them. We notice that the total dimension is always two. So that's definitely a common feature and it's extremely important for integrability. This can be actually nicely understood in the context of QFT, but I will not go there now. It's, uh, it's a nice little story to take too long for and too far away from where you want to go. Um, but let me just mention a few applications that are more, a bit more recent, that might be closer to things that you are working on. So in high energy theory, it occurs in ADS DFC. Uh, both on the ADS and on the CFC side, uh, well, in many examples, integrable structures appear and are studied. I'm just no way an expert, but here, uh, Didina and Ivan are really experts. In, uh, I mean, there are many more people working on this stuff. The next one, so this is n equals four generally, right? n equals four super young mills. Then you can also look at n equals two super young mills theory. And then by work of Seibrecht Witten, classical integrable systems occurs. And more recently, in the graph of Eschatich, really found it also, you, you can kind of quant quantum integrable systems occur. And then there are many, many, many more. So there's stories in N equals one, super young mills. One that I also would like to mention um, is high energy QSED. So N equals zero. And Risha in the back here is the, the expert on that. Then another area is conformal field theory. So um, Bajanov, uh, Lukianov and Zamolochikov realized that the conformal, any conformal field theory, you can kind of build an integrable system inside it using the conformal field theory data. And um, more generally, also the integrable systems are very nice because they're very well under control. So you can really try to study their conformal field theory, the continuum limit, and make connections to conformal field theory. And in that area here, uh, Hubert, uh, Chauvin, uh, Jesper are great experts. Then I already mentioned statistical mechanics. So this, that's another one. Uh, so uh, Jesper, Philippe, Di Francesco, Vincent, they work on this. Um, then in particular, there's also statistical physics of the with non-equilibrium, so this is uh, related to things like ASEP and TASEP and so on, and Kiron is a great expert on that topic, and Ivanta also works on it. And then the last application, which is maybe more related to the spin chains, for instance, here, are in condensed matter. 
and there are some signs and why are they work on this? So a lot of expertise actually in instrumentality here at the URC. Um, now, okay, so integrable systems occur in lots of different contexts. And the key is always that somehow the underlying mathematical structure is the same or closely related. And we are happy to work in you know, whichever context and people might have their favorite context, but the ideas are always really going from this mathematics to the kind of physics uh, using this extreme rigid and hard, like uh, rich structure that really allows you to control in great detail uh, computation. Now the plan for the lectures is the following. I want to um, first talk about spin chains. So this is today. Yes, we will see that spin chains are exactly solvable. We will not quite understand today why this happens. So this is going to be the motivation to then go towards the integrability. And for that, actually, it turns out that you need to go to these lattice models. So that will be the topic of the next lecture. And um, probably, actually, we're also going to, to, to be sort of in between these two. So really, the connection between them will be the third lecture, I think. Um, and then maybe also part of the fourth. And then afterwards, I would like to, maybe towards the end, so I don't know, four or five, so let me just say five, we'll go towards some quantum many body systems and reconnect them to spin chains again, depending on how fast we go. But this is stuff that, uh, that I'm working on with Anton and also Medina, and I think it's a very nice and kind of different, uh, but really interesting area, which also is relevant for experiments, so I'll get there too. So this is the plan of the lectures. Um, and this is, of course, very broad and blah, blah, blah. But are there any kind of questions or, or comments at this point? Uh, I'm happy for me to continue. If not, I'll continue. So that was kind of, uh, I guess that was section one. I forgot to leave. But, uh, that was the introduction. So now we will go to that blah, 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 and more real things. So now we're going to think about the Heisenberg, to be precise, x, x, z, spin chain. So that will be the topic of today. So we imagine that this is going to be a model for magnetism. So in a magnetic material, so in some um, Pixel atoms are sitting very nicely in a equally space in a kind of a nicely, nice array. So we imagine a 1D, one dimensional crystal, and we're going to think of it, it's called a spin chain, so because they sit in a one dimensional array. And actually, we will often think of this one dimensional array to be a circle, so periodic. So we have some atoms sitting on a the circle, they don't move, but they have spins. So let's say spin one half, something up and down, or whatever. Uh, like this, and they can interact with each other in some way. And they might interact kind of across longer distances or just between neighbors. This depends on the model. So I will call the number of these atoms L for the length of the chain. And I will denote these, uh, we will call this, these things, we will call them sites. So here's some site L, the L atom. And uh, so at Side L, we have a spin one half, let's say. So I will just focus on the simplest case. So we denote the basis by up and down. And then we have local Pauli matrices. So I will denote by sigma alpha L the alpha Pauli matrix acting at the L side. So if we have L particles, then you should take center products of these things. So what you do is you have this whole thing together. We have a Hilbert space H, which is C2 with that basis. L times, one for each of these sides. And then the alpha Pauli matrix acting at the L side, you just take the identity, L minus one times. So we don't do anything here, here, here. Then we take this sigma alpha, and then we do the identity, the length minus L many times. 
So we see that here we have an operator that acts on L minus one plus one plus big L minus small L, so L random size, so on this space here. And it's just the action of these Pauli matrices at this L size. And I will actually prefer to not use Pauli X, Y, and Z, but instead uh, lowering and raising operators. So for me, I'll take Pauli plus, which is explicitly this matrix, Pauli minus, which is transpose, Pauli Z, diagonal, and I also have the identity. So this forms the basis of all the possible matrices at a single site. And then you can check that they obey the usual uh, relations. So Pauli plus and Pauli minus, they commute to um, Pauli Z. And Pauli Z commutes with Pauli plus or minus, sorry, with Pauli plus, uh, plus or minus Pauli plus or minus. And now we have this at different sites. So we just put subscripts K and L for different sites. And then this commutator is only non zero if we have Pauli matrices at the same site. So I have lots of little representations of SL2. Sometimes we just think of it as SU2. Okay, so this are the local operators that we will build to, to that we will use to build our operators and everything else. So then this Hamiltonian, it is of the following form. So we have some parameter, delta, which we take to be real, and this is called the anisotropy. And then the Hamiltonian depends on this delta, which is minus sum over L in, let me just take a color to explain in a moment what this means, Z to the subscript L, and then H little L, L plus one. And this H, it depends on delta, but I will often omit the delta there, of course. And this is supposed to, this is the, what we call the local Hamiltonian, and I just factor out the minus sign because I find that more convenient. And what this here means, these are just the integers modulo L. So what I mean here is that we have periodic boundary conditions, like the picture suggests. So if at some point we occur, we find an H L L plus one, and this by definition is just H L comma one. So that's what this sum here means. It's a sum over all the neighbors, but periodically. So these are also neighbors. And now this local Hamiltonian, little h l l plus one. Well, we can write it in terms of these Pauli matrices as follows. Maybe leave a little bit of space here if you're taking notes, because we might want to add something later. Um, so the Pauli plus at little l, Pauli minus at l plus one plus the Hermitian conjugate, so Pauli minus at L, Pauli plus at L plus one. And then plus, here we don't need an extra space, delta, Pauli Z at L, Pauli Z at L plus one, minus, well, identity times the identity, but I'm just going to write it as one over two. So if you, so this notation here, notice this is a product, but this one acts at site L, and this one at site L plus one. So really this is like a tensor product of two of these Pauli matrices. So you remember the tensor product means if you take one and you put it in one matrix and you put it inside the other one. So we can actually write this as a four by four matrix acting at site L, L plus one. So then it looks as follows, there's a zero, then minus delta, one, one, minus delta, and a zero. So it's block diagonal and I, subtracted the minus one there to set these two entries to zero. And then this is a four by four matrix. It acts at site L, L plus one. So this notation, just like before, let me write it explicitly. This means that we have the two by two identity L minus one times. Then we have this four by four matrix from there. And then we have more identities, but only L minus L minus one. So this is already L, L plus one. And this matrix is written, of course, with respect to the 
the standard base is of kind of two sides, so it's up, up, then up, down, then down, up, then down, back. Because of the bases with respect to which you get this matrix. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian. So we have this nearest neighbor interaction between sides, not like this, but rather just like this one and this one, L, L plus one. And they interact in the same way for each pair of neighbors technically along the chain. And there are these terms here. So let's give them some nice physical interpretation. So this here, what happens? What we will do often is we will think of up spins as kind of empty and down spins as a kind of a particle or an excitation. Empty thing. Then for those down spins, these are just a kinetic term. They're hopping between nearest neighbors only. Whereas this part here is the potential energy. So if two down spins are aligned or anti aligned at neighbors, uh, I mean, if two spins are anti aligned or aligned at neighboring sites, then they, they give some potential energy. And here I've just shifted this. Uh, so this is just, this is so that H delta on the vector up, 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 up is zero. So it's just a bit more convenient. We don't have to kind of carry around some of this G here. Um, OK, so this is the model. And this model's magnetic material. So Um, let's see. Uh, so it's like yeah. potential energy and kinetic energy. Or, or, yeah, like yeah. It's like a discretized, but this is kind of like a discretized, well, we will see this more clearly later on, but this is a bit like, this relates to a discretized der second derivative. So you think of this as some kind of Schrodinger operator, but on a lattice. So this is a kind of a lattice version of the Laplacian in some sense. We will see this more care precisely later on. And here, it's kind of a potential energy, because here, you just have two adjacent spins, and they interact depending on whether they're aligned or not. Here, instead, you see that what you do is, if there's an up spin um, at site L plus 1, you make it a down spin, and here you make the down spin an up spin. So it means that you hop a down spin one side, to the left or to the right. You are, you are the only one who has a... Right. So that's... Right. So that's the right. So Right, so I should actually say, so the, 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 the picture that I have in mind here is sometimes called a, a, a quantum lattice gas with hardcore, because they're not allowed to sit on the same side, bosons, in fact. Uh, but of course, we're in 1D, so you can bosonize from behind. So the, whether they're bosons or not doesn't matter so much, but formally, these if you create a downspin in one or in kind of two downspins, it doesn't matter in which order you create them. So in that sense, it's kind of a bit like quasi. The number delta yes. will be termed at the beginning since I have been there. Oh no, delta is just, just a parameter. So this model yes, depends on one. It's just a real number. It's just a real number. Yes. We will see. Uh, that is right. So it's a, an isotropy parameter. So you see, if delta is very large, then the potential dominates. So it's kind of like a coupling. Um, okay, and so we think of the, the bosons, we think of them as the downspins, for instance, it doesn't matter, and hardcore is because you can't occupy the same side. So you can either think of this as a model for magnets or for some sort of, uh, well, discretized one directional this uh, hopping particle model. And okay, so I want to say something about whether or not this is really realistic. Because one thing that's really cool, and it's a development of kind of quite recently, is that this model is actually it's it's really uh, realistic. It really describes extremely well some things that occur in nature or in the lab. And so let me just make a small remark here about that. So the features of this model 
are firstly is one dimensional. So in terms of space, or one maybe plus one, but I'm focusing on the space now. Dimensional, so very low dimensions. So you might complain that this is not very realistic because we live in three spatial dimensions. However, nowadays in the laboratory, people have extremely good control using um, optical lattices and so on, and they can really kind of make confining potentials, which essentially make particles move in one direct in one dimension only. It's not completely true, but they can really very strongly kind of prohibit particles to move in any of the other two directions. So such a one-dimensional space can really be built in the lab. Um, so, for instance, optical lattices. Other things. And also it occurs in nature, actually. So there are some magnetic materials, which, of course, are metals or that are uh, compounds that are three-dimensional materials. But in these cases, it can happen that the spins of the particles only really feel each other in one direction. So it can also happen that interactions are effectively 1D. So this is not, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not great. It kind of misses out many models, but actually there are many, many physical systems, but it does really correspond to reality in some ways. And uh, these are really developments in the last few decades. And um, yes, but that's quite cool, I think. Uh, then the next feature is that this is only nearest neighbor. So the particles can only hop to neighbors and they only feel each other if they're sitting at neighboring sites. But this is a, a restriction of the model, it's an assumption of the model, and it turns out to be very good for, for, for certain materials. So in fact, one thing which in nature is has effectively one-dimensional interactions and has been that essentially only feel each other between neighboring atoms is, um, I have to look this up because, so it's a compound called KCU. F3. Um, so for normal people, this is called perovskite. Cubic perovskite. And um, this is extremely nice. So I strongly encourage you to look up this archive paper. It's a publication in PRL, I think. Um, 1307.4071. Um, so they've done neutron inelast inelastic neutron scattering on this uh, with this material, and then the neutrons interact via their spins with this material, and they can use this to measure stuff with this material. And what they've done is they've measured certain things experimentally and compared these two results that you get from this beta ansatz that we will talk about later. And it turns out that the beta ansatz really ac ac account extremely well for the properties of this model. So even though you know, we're only having a one-dimensional model and we're having nearest neighbor interactions. And actually another thing which is not so realistic is that it's, we use these periodic boundary conditions. And of course, normally in nature, these things are not really periodic, but if you take the length L to be sufficiently large, then you may hope that this is not really important, your choice of boundary conditions. And so it turns out that all these three things really work very well for this periodic piece. So this is extremely cool, I think. And I can mention that in this case, delta is essentially minus one. Um, and there are, if you're interested, I can give you five other uh, names of other complicated chemical uh, things which have delta as minus one and minus a half, and I don't know. So it really occurs in nature and it's super cool and they can really do experiments. And, you know, so even though it goes from mathematics, it goes to, to real. To real. Yes. It's also realistic to have this only along the sphere axis. Right. So, okay, so indeed. So, one thing that you can wonder is uh, why do we make the z direction special? I mean, why did we make one direction special? That it was z is not important, of course, but that one direction is special. Um, so we don't have to do this. So the reason why I wanted to optionally leave a little bit of space here is that what you can do is you can add another coupling, which is called capital gamma. Let me just write this down. Um, so here there's a one plus gamma over two, and then we have to add one more term plus one minus gamma over two, and then we get sigma plus sigma plus L L plus one, plus sigma minus sigma minus L L plus one. So we have to add this to the local Hamiltonian. What it does in this matrix is it changes this one to a one plus gamma over two, and then there's a 
in the complete cross diagonal part, there's a one minus gamma over two. Um, so this model is also, so now we have a second coupling, which is the parameter, which is also real. And this in general is called the X, Y, Z spin chain because it has different couplings in three directions. So you can consider it and it will be more general, it will describe more materials in nature. However, mathematically, this is extremely much harder than if you were just gamma equals to one. So I will focus mostly on the case, or actually exclusively on the case gamma is one. And then we get what is called the XZ model. You can already guess that if you would also set delta equal to one, then you get the XXX model, which of course can cause some kind of weird searches on the internet if you don't carefully add some scientific words. Um, but it's a standard name for this model. So uh, we have the XYZ, XXZ, same chain. And XXX is slightly easier, but really it doesn't matter so much. So XXZ, with this delta, basically we have to do the same analysis to understand it. And uh, so that's why I want to use it. It's nice to have this delta to play around with, um, but it's uh, it's not much harder than if we would set delta equal to one. Whereas this, yeah, so this gamma really uh, complicates life. In a very interesting way, of course. Yes? Is it also that the combination of these two things right before we get the material? So well, so actually, so you can you can actually look it up on the internet. So it looks like a blue, like a, like a blue glass. Kind of. It's really like a stuff that you can touch. And apparently, some artists used it in um, I don't know a few decades ago to kind of completely uh, yeah, kind of dress the room. So it's very cool because he, he built kind of a huge version of this this model uh, in reality. Um, but so the fact that it's interesting is because it's a realization in nature of this model that you might say is a little bit unrealistic because we only have one dimension and so on. So yeah. I mean, maybe it's also a logarithmic stretch, but if I take a, a computer and I put a big mass of this formula, is it a physical realization of the, of the thing? I mean, I understand, but... No, so I mean, I would like, well, I mean, uh, that is uh, philosophy, maybe it's not uh, my... Yeah, and I know that it's very provocative. Right, no, 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 but so what, what I mean is that even though we make some restrictions that are a priori, you know, maybe make this model kind of like unphysical, but just mathematically nice, and then we can talk about universality and blah, blah, blah. But in fact, it does describe at least some things that are actually, you know, like actual yeah. stuff in nature. So that I think is very cool. Because, you know, this topic is very technical, so sometimes you forget that it's about real, real stuff. Uh, the feel of the electron is very hot. Yeah, 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 right. But, uh, but, right, but they might actually feel each other at a little bit longer range, or they might, <laughs> they're probably not going to be really periodic. And they might also be able to hop in all directions. So yes, yeah, so spin one half is the least <laughs> of the unrealistic uh, assumption. Um, okay. So maybe let's see how we're doing. Okay. So let me try to keep this because this will be the model that we'll talk about all the time. So try to just keep it there. Hoping to erase. All right, so one thing that I want to do is we talked about this delta, so let's just explore a tiny bit. Um, well, okay, maybe I should say the goal, of course, is to study the spectrum, so the energies and the eigenvectors and maybe we'll use correlation functions and all of this. And the strategy is to do it first for fixed but arbitrary values of L. And then hopefully, well, in fact, one is able to really control the low-lying part of the energies and the correlation functions to such an extent that you can really understand uh, sometimes analytically and sometimes at some point mathematically um, what happens if you send L to infinity. And that's really how you get com make complex with the experiments. So that's the goal. Now, this sending the length to infinity part is really about either analysis or numerics. I don't want to go into either of them. I want to stay with the algebra. So I will stay at the finite but fixed L uh, throughout. So to get some intuition of what this model looks like, let's take two spin chain things. So we can just send this delta to plus or minus infinity if we take this Hamiltonian and we divide by delta to make sure that the result is finite. And then we get minus or plus, because remember there was this minus sign in front times a sum over pairs, and then we just have this 
sigma z, sigma z, L, L plus one, minus the identity part. So this is a, think about it, the shift is not so important. This is just a one dimensional easing model. This Hamiltonian is already diagonal. So in fact, if you just put down, you know, the basis vectors, they're all already eigenvectors. So it's kind of a quite a trivial model. This is a classical model because everything is diagonal. So you don't really need to think about superpositions and so on. So it's just a 1D classical stat map. But not two dimensional, like I mentioned uh, here, but one dimensional. So it's kind of so simple that it's uh, a little bit boring, but it's also very good because we can easily understand what's going on here. So we have these two possible signs. So if we take a plus or a minus, we can immediately think what's the lowest energy. So which vectors have the lowest energy? So if you have the plus sign there, uh, so the upper the upper sign here, maybe I should say upper and lower. Then the lowest energy is achieved if all the spins are aligned in one direction or the other. This is actually just you have this sign because you divide by divided. Ah, that's actually true, yes. Um, yes. So, okay, so all the spins are aligned if they are the lowest energy here. And then how do you, well, what does energy come from? So in terms of this, um, so we can interpret this, with this term in another way. What this does is it just counts, so it's a number operator, for the number of occurrences of misaligned spins. So each time you have misaligned neighbors, it's going to cost you some energy. So here, everybody's aligned, everybody's happy, uh, so that's good. But we understand now too that the lowest excitations are those cases in which you have, well, you must have something like this, so kind of some domain um, like this, or the opposite. Some domain like this. Of course, these kind of domain walls, they should, since we are in a periodic system, there should be two, there will be two domains at least. So we cannot just get one domain, but the lowest thing, the smallest thing we can do is we can make, we can switch in some region uh, all the spins, and so that there are two of these domain walls, two of these misalignments, and this will be the lowest excitation above this transit. Instead, if we take the opposite side, so let's assume that L is even here, because I don't want to think about frustration now. Then there are also two ground states, we can be alternating. So up, down, up, down, up, down, alternatingly all the way. Or you could start the other way around, down, up, down, up, etc. And in this case, smallest excitations are those cases in which we flip one of the down spins, and then here we have down, flip, flip, or the other way around. So we have this alternating just like this, and we flip one of the intermediate up spins. So we see here that these are maximally polarized, whereas these have net polarization zero. So these are both models for magnetism, but one of them is ferromagnetism, and one of them is anti-ferromagnetism. So that's kind of nice. So with this, we understand very easily two very special limits of this issue that spin chain. Your lowest uh, excitation for the pair one bit case, uh, the, the domains, you should have a larger domain than one in this. Here. You mean? No, for uh, the pair? Um, well, so what do I want to do? Here I want to have maximally many misalignments. Um, okay. You should flip inside the, you should flip every spin inside the, the interval. Right, so, so you still have a right, that's actually true, right. Okay, yes, yes. So you can just have, you have, you have to have kind of two, kind of not domain walls, but the opposite somewhere, but these two kind of can move just right. So indeed, so you can kind of extend this, so you kind of have a zone, let's call this, I don't know, side A and this side B, then what you really have is A everywhere, then a small region with B, 
and then a again, uh, and then a again, or the opposite, right? That's right. So then B. Um, similar to here, so here a and b were kind of like the same So let me tell you, just for your intuition, that if you would do all the computations that I'm going to hopefully talk about today, and you would also do the analysis of sending L to infinity, then you would find the following phase diagram. In fact, you can do this also for finite L, so maybe if so, then I want to take L even, and I'm going to only think about zero temperature. So we have just a one-dimensional phase diagram, so we have delta, and it can have values from minus infinity to plus infinity, with some special values at minus one, zero, one. So we already saw, here we have an easing, which is anti-ferromagnetic easing. Here we have ferromagnetic easing. Here we have this special case, which is called the XXX spin chain. And it is the ferromagnetic XXX. Whereas here, there's an XXX chain, which is anti-ferromagnetic. This is not completely clear yet, but it's also XXX, but I'll get there in a moment. Um, and so this whole regime is ferromagnetic. So let me just write it here. And it's called the axial regime. Because if you kind of think of the spins as living on a circle, then this delta is kind of somehow like squashing, like squeezing or squashing the sphere in one direction. And if delta is large in absolute value, then it's kind of like a very elongated kind of, uh, uh, you know, something that looks a bit like this. And here as well, but this is also axial. Whereas this here in the middle is called planar. But instead we have something that looks very flat, kind of squeezed version of the sphere. And um, this whole regime here is anti-ferromagnetic whole part. This one was all ferromagnetic. And here in the middle, this is called paramagnetic. So it's some sort of weak version of magnetism. And here we already have a nice, at least in the ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic axial regime, we have some sort of intuitive idea of what the structure should look like. In, in your mind, you know, delta is going to correct this a bit, but vaguely it will behave kind of like what we have here. So here we're also lucky. At delta zero, there's also a very special model. This is sometimes called the, well, the XX thing, because the, the delta is zero, so it's kind of like XX zero. Unfortunately, some people also call it the XY chain, which I think is a very bad name, because it's not the XY zero chain. Uh, but I think in that case, it just meant that it's kind of like in a plane. Things are only at the X and Y direction and nothing. So, but anyway, it should be called the XX chain. And this is actually very nice. It's also very simple. This is a free fermion model. I'll explain this also a bit about this in a second. Um, right, so this is the, the phase diagram of the model. Do you have an outside picture of the Well, I mean, it's a big switch, but if you think classically of the spins, then it's like unit vectors on a sphere, and the delta kind of deforms the, the, the sphere, it kind of stretches it or squeezes it along the z direction. So that's the, 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 the sort of picture. Yeah, Right, I mean, so they will definitely behave very differently if you would think. Right, um, well, maybe that's a different way of saying it, right. So if delta is very large, then spins want to really point up or down. Um, whereas if delta is kind of close to one, then the spins are kind of happy to sit more, be more generally distributed or in point in the x, y direction if you really have Yeah, there is another terminology which confuses me completely. Sometimes they call easy plane, easy axis. Right, right. So people say easy axis and easy plane, but I think just axial and planar is a bit better. Another thing that people use is they call these regimes massive, because the related conformal field theories are massive, and these gases are massive plus. Uh, 
I said it's another affirmative issue, but it's kind of thinking about the algorithm infinity, which I do not want to do here. So, yeah, so there are different. Yeah, that's possible with the delta larger than one, which is the value. Right, right. So I can also say this. So delta larger than one is massive. And this is mass plus or gap plus or critical. And this is for two gaps. Well, lots of different names for the same kind of for the same for these regions. Is it just be short? What is your delta on this one? Just delta. Hyper control parameter. All right. So, sorry, sorry. So, the, well, so paramagnetic, of course, so what you can do is you can take an expectation of just the spin in the z direction. So, we see that here they're maximally polarized, whereas here they're average zero. Um, so, this is polarized, this is kind of unpolarized, but it has a staggered polarization if you want to do nearest uh, correlations kind of one away from each other. Right. So, you, here you, kind of, you can define this with a second order parameter, and then here you will see that it's still this one. Right, so that's the, that's the thing that you would measure to, to distinguish these things. Right. So, well, I'm going slower than I thought, but it's good because there's interaction. So maybe before we take a break, let me just give a, an exercise. For, so, as I said, so these feral and anti feral magnetic phases, they have a sort of a toy model that we can use to think about, you know, how should we think of the physics here, namely the, the just the one dimensional easing model. So, this intermediate region, which is more complicated and more interesting physically, um, here um, also has this special point at delta zero. So here's an exercise, if you want. So for delta zero, what you can do is, well, the goal is to find the spectrum. Spectrum, so all the energies. And you do this by jordan Wigner. So, um, so there's a jordan Wigner transformation. And it goes as follows. So you define, so you notice if you do some computations with these boundary matrices, then you see that they um, they actually uh, anti commute at the same, I mean, they have a good, if you think of this as a raising and a lowering operator, then you have kind of good commit, uh, anti commutation relations at one side, but at different sides, of course, they commute with each other. So that's not very good for fermions. So what you need to do is you need to modify them a little bit. So you still have sigma plus and sigma minus, but you modify them a little bit so that you really get nice fermionic operators. So we define Cl to be uh, basically sigma plus L, but with a tail of sigma z on the left. And we define then, of course, C dagger L is, well, the dagger of this, so still the tail of sigma z and then sigma minus. And then you can check that you can also define if you want NL, which is the number operator at the side L, which is C dagger L C L, and it's also just the same as one minus sigma Z L over two. So this counts the number of fermions, where I now think of the fermions as the downstream. So now I think of them as fermions. So what we kind of typically were doing now is we're kind of fermionized from what I first said it was a bosonic was the bosonic type of gas. So then what you can do, okay, so first check that they obey the canonical anti-commutation relations. So the anti-commutator of CK and CL is delta KL. And the anti-commutator of CK and CL without any dagger or with both daggers is zero. And also check that they obey the following boundary condition. So if you formally define, kind of extend this formula and you have a CL plus one, where you remember that our boundary conditions were periodic for the spins, then what you find is that this is minus one to the n times C1, where m is the total number operator. So it's the number of um, downspins. On the whole chain. Okay, so that's a simple part. Then the second thing is, and 
know, there are different levels of uh, in at which you can do this exercise depending on how courageous or masochistic you are. Uh, the simplest version is you just take delta at zero. Or if you want to do a little bit more, you can take general delta. Or if you really want to go full on, you can take this XYZ model, which also has the gamma. Maybe I should write gamma and delta. Red, and share it in red. So H, gamma, and delta. So any of them you can write via these C and D daggers. Then you will, the, 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 the more hardcore version you do this exercise, the more you will see what this model looks like in general. And the nice thing is what you will see is that if you now Fourier transform, so we go to momentum space, uh, so we write C L dagger, for instance, as one over square root of L sum over, okay, I'll write that in a second, E to the I C L, and then C still the dagger L with a B, but this creates a particle with momentum C. And then the sum goes over all the, um, the Cs in 2 pi over the length times integers modulo L, except that we have this twisted boundary condition sometimes, periodic or anti-periodic. So here I have to put, let me, I don't know, do this in a different color. It is plus a half if um, M is odd. Because of those anti-periodic boundary conditions. So if you express the Hamiltonian in terms of those guys, you Fourier transform to express it in terms of the momentum creation and annihilation operators, then you can, well, read off spectrum at delta is zero. And actually there's a reward if you are willing to go red level, then you will see that this still works in the red level. Sorry, what is M? This is what this the total number of downstreams. This is the total number of Ferenciae. So depending on which uh, sector is, how many fermions you have, your uh, periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions, but the Fourier transform has to be appropriate. And the nice thing is that so this, in fact, this x y zero, real x y zero model, the x y z thinking at uh, delta is zero, it you can still read off the spectrum. There. So that's very nice. That's the free fermion model, which is quite non-trivial because we understand in the fermion picture. I didn't mention this, but it's kind of clear that. This is kind of like fair creation or annihilation. Yes. So it's a, it's a bit richer model. Okay, so the cool thing is that we have this regime. We have kind of a very simple model in one extreme. We have a very simple model in the other extreme. They're very simple in position space. Just the standard basis is already diagonal. And then right in the middle, we have another very simple model that is simple in momentum space. So here the ground state would look like a, you know, like a Fermi, uh, like a, a C. And then excitations are kind of moving, taking one particle inside the C and moving it outside. So it's kind of in a way similar to this, but then in momentum space rather than position space. And the XYZ, sorry, the XXZ spin chain interpolates between these different models. And um, I want to understand the spectrum throughout. Okay, I think it's time for some break. Maybe any questions? Is there any? Oh, 10 minutes. Yes. No question? Yes, I left the answer. 10 minutes.
the menu. Okay, so we're going slower than I thought, but it's fine. I think it's uh, good to uh, take it easy and have lots of questions. One thing that I should mention, I, I mentioned this vaguely here, but I think it's important. So nowadays, what they can do is either with ultra pulse atoms or with um, trapped ions, they can really use these. Well, I don't know what to call atoms, and I have no idea what they do, but they can really put atoms very precisely in a lattice and so on. So they can really engineer these type of systems, and they can really engineer uh, these Heisenberg spin chains. They can they have they can control the value of delta. So they can do experiments where they kind of they prepare the system at one value of delta, and then they can kind of suddenly change the value of delta and see what happens and so on. So they have really extremely good control over this, and this is in particular important because these are also precisely. I mean, this would be called the quantum simulation of the Heisenberg XXZ spin chain. And this is done by labs that are at the same time really working on quantum computers. So these type of, this is precisely the machinery that people use to build quantum computers with these trapped ions and so on. So, so also there, these models are good. Uh, you know, they, I mean, they, they really might pertain to quantum computing as well. Um, so anyway. Um, OK. So before we go, so what the goal is to understand the spectrum of this model in all the other values of delta that we haven't treated yet. And for this, we're going to do something which is called the beta method. But before we get there, I want to do a little bit of thinking about the symmetries and, and kind of the physical kind of quantities that are in this system. So let's do this. Um, so this was part 2.1, I guess, the Heisenberg XXZ chain. So here we get 2.2, if you like numbering. Uh, so the symmetries of the model. So okay, so for the first part, let's kind of make the model slightly more general. Let's say that we take H delta and we plot add or subtract, doesn't matter, H times the sum of Pauli Z. So basically, orange was my typical color. This is an external magnetic field, a longitudinal. external magnetic field of course a similar question to before arises you could put this magnetic field in any direction but to preserve instability unfortunately we have to put this longitudinally otherwise it, uh, you, know, you might even do numeric instability but not uh, instability and if you think about this in terms of these uh, quantum uh, these, these hopping uh, particles then this is like a chemical potential so it kind of favors some filling fraction uh, that you can tune with this parameter h. And in fact, it's known in this phase diagram. You can expand it to this, uh, include this value of h. But now I want to just uh, for a moment include it because there is another little exercise. So the first two symmetries are very simple. So they're just two parts of a little exercise. So define, let's say, u, because it's unitary, to be the product over all sides of Pauli x at that time. So Pauli x, oh, I haven't defined it, so I should actually give it now. Uh, oh, you can just let's just do sigma plus at L and sigma minus at L. That's Pauli x. Um, so this operator, what it does is it, it just globally flips this, so it reverses up and down. So this is called the global spin flip. And what you can check, so that's the exercise is that uh, if you conjugate u delta h, sorry, is this Hamiltonian by u? And u is its own inverse, so that's also easy. Um, you get the Hamiltonian at delta, but with minus h. Right, so it really flips all the spins. So this Hamiltonian that I wrote down before doesn't change at all, and you just change the sign of this constant h as well. So that's, uh, that's only the only reason that I put it here, so that we can actually see what this thing does. Um, also, this, this commutes with the Hamiltonian, as we will see in a moment, so this is a good thing. Second part of the exercise is we define a second operator, which we call V. This is now not the product over all sides, but over every other side. So we write L is 1 up to, and then the integer part of L over 2. Right? So this part here, this is a bit unfortunate that this kind of L floor looks a lot like capital L. This is a slash L floor, capital L over 2, slash R floor. Um, and then what we do is um, we're going to do sigma z every other side. So this is kind of like a staggered way of kind of measuring the spin z, I guess. Um, maybe. 
And now let's assume that L is even. Then what you can check is that if you conjugate just H delta, I don't want to now this uh, magnetic field to have its role. Then what you're going to get is minus H minus delta. So this is a nice operation because it tells us that, you know, I hear a fixed sign in front and then I allow for all values of delta. And I'm talking about plus and minus one. And I was already mentioning that delta is minus one is also x, x, x in some sense. This is the reason why it's similar to the delta is one. Because up to the overall sign of the Hamiltonian, you can reverse delta by some unitary transformation. So the spectrum is the same. And of course, this minus sign in front kind of flips the ferromagnetic and the empty, it flips the spectrum upside down. So instead of being up, 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 being favorable, now up, down, up, down, up, down is favorable. Or the spin, the spin flip, of course. I'm confused. Uh, the inverse A use uh, sigma L plus sigma L minus. Yes. The sigma H use sigma C. Yes, but they're different. There is no confusion, and I think it's just different it's operators. Not a, it's not a, no, no, no. So this is not a this is not a staggered spin flip. This is just some sort of staggered staggered something with sigma. Yes, right, right, right. So you can so physically this is like a rotation over pi of all the spins, whereas this is just something else. Um, it's just some some useful useful operator. It's a simple diagonal operator, and it's extremely nice because it tells us that we can restrict ourselves. To this sign that I put in front and consider all values of delta, positive or negative, at the same time. Um, by the way, we can also give a kind of a more hardcore version of this. If you take L in fourth, then here you get with empty periodic boundary conditions. So sigma plus or minus L plus one or minus. Sigma plus minus one, the sigma z is unaffected. But the symmetry between delta and minus delta is really special to, if you want to change, not change the boundary conditions, it's very special to play even. Um, but if you don't really mind switching a little kind of twist, we call it, then you can do this for any length. And the operator is the same. That's why I put uh, carefully the help flow of our work. So that's uh, one thing. All right. Next, more important, um, is what I call partial isotopy. So it means that we have a U1 Z, let's say, symmetry. So define S Z to be the sum of a half Pi z at all sides. So this is really this magnetization operator. This magnet, this kind of. It's closely related to this n that I had here. So then, what you can check is that for all values of delta, as z commutes with this Hamiltonian. This, by the way, is very special for this gamma equals to one in terms of the x, y, z parameter. So this is this is the reason why x, y, z is so much harder than um, than, than x, x, z. So maybe we can gamma is equal to one. So what it means is the following. It means that we can diagonalize. Maybe we can uh, diagonalize h delta. Per um, m, which is the same as that m, which is l over two times the identity minus this total spin z operator, and this is just the number of down spins. So we can fix the number of down spins, and then we restrict ourselves. The Hamiltonian preserves this vector, so we can just take linear combinations of vectors with fixed number of down spins. So that's a bit better because we don't need to take linear general linear combinations, but we can take only certain linear combinations in our consideration. Um, so now we're going to write down in this useful the thing called the coordinate basis.
So inside this sector of the Hilbert space, there's a basis, and it's just a good way of labeling them. And this notation is not super common, but I think it's very good. So we're going to build a vector which has m integers, and then here I'm going to put a double kind of a double um, wrangle, just to indicate that if I have something with this stuff, then these integers mean the following. We flip a down spin at positions L1 up to Ln if we start from this vector. Right? I think in physics we have a kind of a habit of you know denoting anything by uh, a cat, but sometimes it's a bit annoying because then I have to interpret, you know, if it's a cat of L, then it means something different than if it's a cat of a P or whatever. But then if I want to set L to one, I mean then I don't know anymore if it was L or P that I set to one. So I think this is better. Now I can just you know, actually write down numbers in there if I want to. No, it says, of course, to really get a basis, I have to restrict myself to positions of these down spins. I can just order them from one to L on the chain. So then it's repeated. If you like a little bit more, if you're a bit more representation theoretic, mind this. And what we're doing is we decompose the full Hilbert space to a direct sum of h, I will denote them h sub m, although the standard mathematical notation would be h l minus 2m, so these are weight spaces. And in physical terms, I want to call this the m particle vector, or the m magnum. So what's going to happen is that this h delta is block diagonal one block for m. So if I take m is zero, there's only one vector which is zero down spins. So we can kind of there's a sort of going to be a little one by one block. Then if I have one down spin, I can put it at l different positions. So here I have an l times l block and so on. And eventually I'm going to get an l choose m times l choose m block. And this is going to kind of be symmetric so Towards the end, it's going to look like this again. And we have zeros everywhere. And we want to understand the, eigen, the spectrum and you know, eigenvectors, eigenvalues of each of these blocks separately. Wait, wait. What do you mean by h of n minus 2? As it here? Oh, so, well, in mathematics, you usually write weight spaces like this, right? So you kind of ah, like okay, so d of lambda. But in this case, it's just f of 2, so lambda is only a single number, and this is. You can also write it if you like gl2 better, it's l minus m, comma m. And then for highest weights, m should be at most l, stay further and so on. But this was the, I will just use this h subscript m. So it's not really important what I meant by putting here. Um, okay, now there's a way, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because I think this is usually not done and it's extremely nice. So you can really kind of draw the structure of this Hilbert space and I will add stuff as we go. So let me explain how this works. So I'm going to draw Hilbert space and a number of dots. And each dot represents a basis vector. And the basis vector may or may not be an eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. So the goal is to describe each of these dots as an actual eigenvector of the Hamiltonian that we have. But let's we will do this slowly kind of to really kind of kind of we will be able to say we're now looking at this vector here. It works as follows. So let's draw a grid where here I'm going to draw my M. So we go from M is zero. One dot 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 down to L, and um, concretely, my L is four. So, I mean, when when I'm going to draw it, so there's one dot that has zero. So remember, this was the number of down spins. So there's the most at least zero and at most L down spins. There's only one dot which has zero down spins. So actually, we know what this dot is. This is just the vector above us. Then there are L different vectors, in my case that's going to be four, which have one down spin. So they could be, for instance, these coordinate basis vectors, but those are not eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, so I want to take, I want to really, I would like them to be something else. Then here in my example, so we go down, so there's zero, one, two, three, and then four. So maybe I should be a little bit nicer. And then this picture has this, and then there are actually two sitting here. So this is the structure. So now how do I know this? Well, 
um, that we will move this block diagonal structure. Because on this axis, we already know that here we have L choose M. This is the size of these sectors, right? So here, there is a one by one block. Then here, for M is one, there is an L, there are L dots. And then eventually you get L choose N of them as a function of M. So we can actually draw this. If you think of the binomial as in terms of gamma functions, then you can actually draw it. And it kind of, it's this enveloping curve like that. Right, so that somehow what controls this shape. And if you would increase L, then this shape looks more or less the same, but you get more and more and more dots inside of it. And I would like to understand better what the structure of these dots are. So firstly, this fixed M means that we consider so fixed M, M is a single row in this picture. Right? So M is kind of tuning which row I want to talk about. Um, we also know that we can, if we, if we take the middle here, this is sometimes called the equator, which occurs that M is equal to L over 2, which may or may not be an actual value of M that, that happens. Right? depending on whether L is even or odd, then flipping this picture like this is precisely the action of conjugation by this operator U there. Right, so I take a vector here, I mean, well, or action of U. By U. So in particular, of course, we know that this guy here is just a down, down, down vector. In my kind of fancy notation, I could maybe say that this is the empty set coordinate basis vector. This is one all the way up to L coordinate basis vector. And now here, I'm going to, I'm not going to write here because we'll get better information later on. But here, for instance, I could, I have, for example, these denotes the vectors L coordinate basis vector for all the different L's from one to big L. So does this make sense, this picture? So I haven't really told you what the depth dots are exactly, but we're going to make more and more precise at this point. And we will, it will help us visualize which parts we are missing. Um, also, I, we can also already say, by the way, that our first eigenvector is um, just uh, this up, 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 up guy. So H delta I already mentioned before is zero. So it's a bit of a boring one. And of course, its spin flip is also one of them. By the way, the spin flip, it allows you, of course, it's enough to just understand all the dots up to this equator, because then we get everything else from spin flip. So by spin flip symmetry suffices to take m at most equal to this equation. Is it a bundling of dots not corresponding to energy vectors? No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. It's really just the eigenvectors to Hilbert space. So I just wrote, I just drew two to the L dots, and I'm going to organize them and label them in more and more precise ways. So I'm going to kind of, you know, assign quantum numbers, if you wish, to my dots. That's what I want to do. I want to really say each of these eigenvectors is going to be precisely this one. That's the goal. I mean, they are not equally. That's something that you need to be the what eigenvector. All right. So at the moment they're not eigenvectors, but I want them to be. I want. I want to think of these dots as the distinguished spaces of the Hilbert space, which are actual eigenvectors of my homotopy. So this this dot I know. This one I can really say this is an eigenvector. This one I don't know yet, but it's easy. We're going to do it very soon. These are going to be harder. So you're, you're going to specify your vectors, and then at the end you will be able to say. They are the eigenvectors. That's right. That's the goal, of course. We want to compute all the eigenvectors and the energies and so on. So that's where we're going. <coughs> but now at least I can say, you know, I want to know what this guy is. It's a bit more concrete than what is generally like in this case. So I'll add some information to this. So um, as we go. Would there be the generalities? The there will be. Well, it depends. So that's the next point, basically. Um, I'm going to. 
let's first remove these discrete symmetries. I think there's something else that we uh, and then we can actually remove these discrete symmetries. So there's a mixed point. All right. So sometimes degeneracy may occur, and here's an important case where that happens. So. So the isotropic, I will write stuff related to isotropic in blue. So there's an isotropic point. So what we can also define is we can define these ladder operators, S plus and S minus, which are just the sum of the local value matrices over all sides. And they certainly, they flip at all sides to spin in one way or the other way. So these are, if you wish, SQ2 ladder operators. A physics language or a mathematical language are just SL2, a representation of SL2. Um, so actually, you can compute now your commutators. So S plus S minus commutates to twice SZ, because I put this minus this uh, half in front of SZ. And SZ commutates with S plus or minus with a plus or minus. And these operators do not commute with homotopies normally. However, if delta is one, so this is the isotropic point, then S plus and minus commute with that Hamiltonian. So what this means is that if we found an eigenvector, then we can apply S plus or S minus to it, we will still get an eigenvector, and it will have the same symmetry. In this case, this will lead to degeneracy. And so, in fact, these degeneracies, so let me in my picture draw in blue, in the isotropic case, there are degeneracies. So what happens is you take this up, 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 up guy, and you can exon it with S minus. So let me connect them by a blue line. It kind of indicates that you can lower. And then we actually explicitly didn't know what this in my notation it would be the sum of all the L's. Because you just flip a spin at one side. So this vector we we know in the in the delta is one case. And all of these have the same energy. Similarly, if I would be able to find this one, then I can get these guys. And likewise here, and likewise here, and in this case, they're not coming. Right? So those would correspond to the length of these strings would correspond to degeneracies if you find these things. There are actually more degeneracies that we'll get to in a moment, but uh, these are some. So, in this case, here it suffices to find a psi such that, well, I want them to be eigenvectors of my Hamiltonian, and I want them to be annihilated by the plus. And physics and uh, mathematical languages are highest weight. Because the SZ is half the weight. So, so let me mark this in red, this condition. Then in my picture, the highest weight vectors are this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, these two. So those are the highest weight vectors that I want to find. Right, and one of them we already found. It's just the sum of all the spins. This one is okay. Maybe in physics language, you can kind of think of this as, as a goldstone. So what happens at delta S1 is that the spin of the Hamiltonian is completely rotationally invariant. So here we chose to start from the up, 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 up spin, which is a vector which has spin kind of pointing maximally in the z direction. But if you're rotationally invariant, then you know you can just move it around and it has the same energy. So you can move infinitesimally, and that is what the action of S uh, minus does, and it will have the same energy. So it's kind of like a flat direction in your in your sort of energy landscape. So these are corresponding also. Are you assuming delta equal one here or sorry? S delta is one. So this is for delta is one. That they have the same energy. Of course I can draw these lines whenever I want, but they have the same energy only at delta is one. Okay, so your strategy you are you wrote on the back here. Right. So you have this true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. So here is in the blue case. In the delta is one case. That's right. And a little remark which is kind of 
useful, it's kind of related, is that if you would take this local Hamiltonian, H L plus one, can I now set delta as one? Then I just get the matrix zero, one, minus one, minus one, one, zero. And you can check that this is just one minus the permutation of the spin F minus one, L plus one, which is the spin permutation. Connection with representation theory here is really because they take one one expression because of it has many expressions. But of course, I mean, I can do the decomposition always if I want, but it can be in terms of these blue lines. But whether or not these are eigenspaces of Hamiltonian, that depends on that. So whether or not things related by blue lines here, I mean, I can always start from this vector, I can always act on it with, uh, with S minus if I want. Uh, but whether or not the result is an eigenvector, that depends on that. But so do, do, do you mean you in delta equal one case you are applying the strategy the standard uh, right. method of representation theory to right. so then, then I only need to find the red one. But the really the point is that in the beta is that I mean we, we will do everything for general delta. And we will at the end see that okay, if delta is one, then some special things happen and it suffices to only look at certain vectors which I can characterize in terms of the beta and that. So it's not a very important thing, but I think it's nice because, for instance, this allows, I mean, it gives some extra structure that you can use to think of the Hilbert space. But to repeat, whether or not this structure is relevant for diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, that depends on the value of the Hilbert. Okay. I remove SZ. Um, okay. So this was a very special point. This is not true. So we will actually. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just going back on this. Uh, yes. The lines. Uh -huh. You said U is acting uh, like a mirror. Ah, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, do we can we see what V does? Um, no, V V relates different values to delta, right? So it kind of changes your model. Um, so th this this is the structure of the Hilbert space. It's not very. I mean, it, it may. I want it to organize it in a way that relates to the Hamiltonian. Um, um, well, in a way, you saw that what V does is sort of well, it doesn't do anything. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to swap delta and minus delta, and it also is related to changing the sign in front of the Hamiltonian. Um, so what somehow this sign relates is whether, so if, remember, the ferromagnetic regime, then the most important vectors are kind of those on the extremes. Whereas in the anti-ferromagnetic regime, um, the most important ones, or more generally, in the axial regime, these are the most important vectors, and these are the lowest excitation. Whereas in the in this middle region that we had, which disappeared, the pyromagnetic region, the planar region, the center here, the, the, the middle, is the most important. So somehow, what this V does, conjugation by V, is kind of saying whether the extremes or the middle is the most important in terms of low-lying excitation. So it's information about the Hamiltonian. But at least the picture is nice because I can find, you know, I can tell you what V somehow is related to. Another symmetry, which is kind of clear, I guess, is homogeneity, so translation invariance. So let me define an operator G on the Hilbert space by telling you what it does on the basis. I take some M, just going to shift them one to the left, let's say. So L minus one, and here I have to be careful that I do modulo L. And then, well, maybe I should write L minus two, L two minus one, dot dot. And minus one. Okay, so it just takes the downspin and it moves them cyclically one to the left along the chain. Clearly, this Hamiltonian is invariant under this. So G H delta the inverse is still H delta. This is true for all values of delta. So we can actually simultaneously diagonalize. H delta. And G. Now G is actually, well, finding the eigenvalues of G is not so hard, because what you notice, of course, is that G to the L 
is just one. If I shift everybody all the way around the chain, nothing can happen. So this is just one. But this completely constrains what the eigenvalues are going to be. So what this tells is that the eigenvalues are of the form e to the i c, where p must be 2 pi over the length times some integer, which is defined only modulo l. So this whole thing is only defined modulo 2 pi because of the free vectors. And this, of course, physically is the momentum. The kind of the lattice momentum to be just discrete shifts by one. And this here is momentum quantization. Which is good because we somehow have some other circles. We expect it to be a moment and a translational variant, so we expect the momentum and we expect it to be quantum. So this is how you do it. And this G in particular, so now I want actually I would like each of these dots not to just to be an H eigenvector, but also to be a G eigenvector at the same time. And this is nice because G at least gives us a little bit more information. Um, so this actually fixes M equals to one. Um, I guess I can remove the coordinate base here. Maybe I should just delete the DSF definition. So now I'm going to basically tell you the results. So it's sort of a semi exercise just to check everything. It's very easy. So check that if I define now I'm going to write, I don't, know, I don't know if it's good notation or not, but it's phi with a tilde, because it's somehow the Fourier transform of the coordinate basis in the m is 1, so 1 down phi vector. So this guy is 1 over square root of the length, sum l is 1 to l, so all the sides, phi to the i phi l, and then the single down phi at size l. So this is just the Fourier transform, so instead of the... Um, the coordinate basis, and this thing here is just a plane wave in physical terms. And you can check that this has momentum p, well, has momentum p. Uh, I mean, maybe I should have called this p, p total, total momentum, total momentum. And here is the parameter p, and its total momentum is equal to the parameter in there, which of course has to be quantized according to our rule. And since g, well, it's easy to see that eigenvectors of g will be orthogonal. And uh, moreover, so, so that's kind of something to convince yourself, all of these vectors are going to be orthogonal for different p's. Moreover, the number of them, well, I just count the number in here, is equal to L, which is also equal to the dimension of my M equals 1 vector. So here we had L dots, and now I found L dots. They're eigenvectors of the, of the translation operator with different eigenvalues, so they're orthogonal. And moreover, they are, um, well, the energy you could compute, but we'll do this later. So this is not part of the energy. So energy later which I guess will be next uh, week. So now I can start adding some stuff in my picture so much. So here, in fact, note that if you would take p equals to 1, then this plane wave disappears. And I just have the sum over all the things up to some normalization. So it's still this vector. So actually this vector, even though here I got it by applying the lowering operator, it also appears as a momentum 0 maximum. So this Goldstone mode is a momentum zero excitation, which has the same energy and the same momentum as the original thing. By the way, the up, 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 up also has momentum zero because it's invariant on the translation. So now actually I can understand all of these. So better here, we take them to be precisely our P tildes. So these guys here in this row, we understand all of these dots. They're indeed all of them, and they're labeled by their momentum. So if I wanted, maybe I should have written this in orange. And then I can now say that this column here has p total equal to 0. This column here has p total equal to 2 pi over the length, total dot, and 
then the last column of two total equal to well, two pi of the length times L minus one, which by the way, modulo two pi, I can also just think of it as minus two pi over L. So these two, they're kind of the same, but they move in opposite directions. In particular, actually, they will have, we will see uh, next time, they will have the same energy. So this is another degeneracy in the spectrum. These two guys have the same energy, but they're distinguished if we further take into account their momentum. So energy, comma momentum is a better way to make this spectrum. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So now we understand this part of the spectrum up to here. So at some point we get M is two. In our picture it's at the middle, but that's of course not the important point. This is the part that we don't understand yet. So now actually you can of course think, okay, this momentum operator is pretty cool, so I can try to understand what it means for the spectrum. So this kind of is it's an optional exercise. This is kind of fun combinatorics. So you can really think about in the two magnon sector, think about which possible momenta can occur. And what kind of happens is that the momentum is related to periodicity, right? If you have some momentum, then it means that your eigenvector has some periodicity. So if your eigenvector has no periodicity, I mean just L periodicity, then your momentum is going to be um, two pi over length. But if your eigenvector has kind of a, it might have an, a periodicity which is just a few times over L, and then it will have some other momentum. So you can kind of think about if I have this spin configuration, blah, 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 you can count how many each time. So each spin configuration, you can think of how many Am I allowed to kind of boost this periodicity momentum? So I can make linear combinations like this here, and then sometimes it will be zero, and sometimes it will not be. And in this way, you can actually do the combinatorics, but it's not super useful. So it just tells you that in here, you will have so many times these momenta, so many times these momenta, but they're still going to be um, dots which have the same momenta. So it doesn't completely tell apart all the different sectors. So the lesson is, so it's not, M, well, I'm not M anywhere in the middle. By the way, maybe to come back to this, so these blue lines, they, they connect things that have the same energy only at delta S1. However, they will always have the same momenta. So that's kind of another kind of thing that is useful to to think of these kind of these blue lines here. They're kind of useful because I already know at least of all these dots what the momenta are going to be. I do not know yet what the momenta are here are going to be here, but at least I know it in the first one. So here, here, P dot, a uh, bit more work. It's combinatorics. It's related to um, the necklace group, representation of the necklace. Anyway, you know, P dot could be always a uh, multiple of pi over. But, um, so, I understand correctly, for M equal 1, you, you are good because you have, just by diagonal G, mm -hmm. you, you find that all, all different eigenvectors, all uh, non degenerate. So, and uh, basically, you know from that that M is P. You have the generality of the spectrum of G. That's right. So, do you know uh, right. for a specific eigenvalue? Do you know already uh, how many? Uh, yes, that's, I mean, that's a solution to the, to the exercise that I didn't write down. So, you can do it with combinatorics, okay, so but it's not, it's not super easy. Um, I guess I know this, so I know very well how to do it, but it turns out that Perry doesn't know what that means. But I'm actually doing it, I know that there's another model which also commutes with G, and its spectrum is much easier, and it's much more simple. So this is what I would do, but <laughs> um, since that's only about G, I can, you know, that's, that's fine. So in that case, I can write down, so that's the model that I want to talk about in the last lecture, it's called the Holden Shastri model. So here, the energy, you can really write down the spectrum completely explicitly. There's a very simple way to label all of these. In this very simple, and then you can kind of trivially compute their momentum and how you know their degeneracies as well. So it's kind of a, a very roundabout way of computing momenta, but that's my way of solving this exercise. Um, so, so there's a way just by taking delta to two and uh, right. So that's kind of really another way. That, uh, yes, that would be another way actually. You can take delta zero, then of course, the Fermion models, you can decide if you want to excite the momentum or not. 
on the mechanical studies computer. But then you have to count how many ways are there to add up to this number of ways. But anyway, there's some combinatorics involved. But the point is that even if you've solved these combinatorics, you still haven't found like the intersection of elements because they're degenerate. They're from n to onward, there will be different phases of changing. Uh, related to the Boolean theorem, counting the action of translations. I mean, you want to count patterns yeah. up and down, which can be related to translations. Yeah, I mean, it's it's some simple representations here, but increase the risk. Um, yeah. It involves, you know, Euler's Dogean functions or some of these great common divisors. You have to, uh, the periods have to divide uh, then depending on whether they do or not. Yeah, so you, you can kind of, you can do it. Uh, I've done it explicitly for habits too at some point, and it was not nice. And then I was like, okay, I know in general, Chris will have to do it in general, but I'm, uh, I'm not going to do it. Um, okay, so then. Maybe one more symmetry that I can add to the picture. Um, I wasn't planning to, but I'm already running behind so much that I can run behind a little bit more. It doesn't matter. Um, because it's a useful symmetry to know. So finally, there's parity, also a discrete symmetry. It is defined, so let me call it capital Phi. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm already using P for this permutation. Um, which will appear in later lectures, so I can't really use P anymore. So Phi is it. So it acts on the coordinate basis by just reflecting. So it is a reflection through the center of the chain. So it's L minus Lm uh, plus 1, L minus L1 plus 1. OK, so I flip all the spins. Of course, here I order them increasingly. So if I want to order this increasingly, I have to reverse the labels. And then uh, you can check that it's indeed is precisely what it does. And you can check then that parity preserves um, conjugating by the parity, which of course squares the entity. It preserves the Hamiltonian for any delta. But the parity, if you translate this G, uh, sorry, if you reverse the G, then you invert, which makes sense, right? If I rotate one direction and then I kind of Flip all the spins, I kind of reverse the order of all the spins, and this is rotated in the other direction. Um, so, in particular, I'm not talking about a box but I'm going to make another box here, which is connected to that box. So, phi squared with identity, so its eigenvalues are plus or minus one. And so, we have two types of states, which is things that are sometimes called. Uh, parity singlet, and we have parity doublet. It's also called parity um, even and parity odd, related to the sign that you get. And so, since conjugation by parity inverts the Hamiltonian, uh, the, 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 the translation operator, it sends p to minus p, right? So what it does is, in general, if you have some p total, it will group p total and minus p total, which of course is the same as 2 pi minus p total, if you want to work in 0, 2 pi. So that's the parity doublet. But sometimes these two numbers are actually the same. Namely, if p total is equal to 0, or if p total is equal to pi. So if you're translation invariant, or anti, if you get a sign, if you translate by one step, then um, parity will preserve you, uh, otherwise it will send you to your kind of a mirror image in some sense. So very good. So now in my picture we can also see what parity does, more or less. In this case it's small enough to really think of it. So here this is a singlet. These two are swapped. This is what I talked about before. So they are degenerate for the Hamiltonian. But same for momentum, and the reason why, why uh, so, uh, but in non degenerate for the momentum. And the reason that I knew it is because I knew that there was going to be parity, which is going to relate to that. And this is generally going to go like this. And then in this case, length is even, so there's one in the middle, which is at momentum pi. This guy is momentum pi, the one in the middle, for easy math. And then these here, well, they're more complicated. So they may be singlets or doublets. Or 
or related to weather moment. If you know weather moment, then you know the answer to this thing. Or you can first think whether there should be gravity even or not. But anyway, so here, p dot and gravity are both a bit more work. Okay, but anyway, it's another truth. So for instance, for x, x, z, these dots, they're not just minus. If they want, if they are, if they should be eigenvectors of H delta, they're not going to just be. I shouldn't really take these applications of S minus, um, but I still know how many, you know, which moments are going to occur, what the priorities are going to be, and so on. So it's a bit useful, but not too much. Yes? Yeah. In the case where a state is invariant under parity, you, you, you can still get the minus sign, right? Yes, uh, so so. Um, it would be set, but, uh, so if you're really invariant under parity, then you should have eigenvalue one under parity, right? So parity should should just fix you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you have uh, ah, with the case under parity? Mm -hmm. I think it should change. Yeah. So so, so psi could go to minus psi. Yeah. yeah, but that has momentum pi, right? So, so that can happen. That's precisely this one. But this is when it's invariant. Pi also. Phi means that if you apply parity. That moment. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought maybe I'm wrong. The moment of zero and pi, yeah. and that in each case, uh -huh. odd, okay. odd in each case, under pi. You could have momentum zero and odd, momentum zero even, momentum pi, odd, momentum pi even. That's what I meant to do. Yeah, I'm not going to answer this right now, but I'll think about it and I'll think about it. Yeah, I think it's a, I remember it's a trick which has been kind of used to see if some model is integrable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll think about this and comment on it uh, next time. Uh, I uh, on the spot is uh, oh, let's go check T equals zero. Right. Yeah, well, um, but it was. Uh, I mean, I think of them as two singlets, or maybe not? not in this model, but in, in principle, you could have two things that are related. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Well, sure. So, that, but that would fall under this under this case. Then. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I, I, I said parity is sort of mildly useful. So, um. Okay. Very good. So now, um, so we have all these symmetry. So we have, you know, we always. Commute with spin z, so we can diagonalize per per row in this picture. We uh, always have the spin flip symmetry, so we can go up to the equator. That's enough. If delta is one, then it suffices to only find kind of get you know the top l choose l over two um, many states. But for general delta, you have to find everybody in the equator and above. Um, we were lucky that some of the symmetry gave us a little bit of this stuff, but certainly. There's a part, kind of the, the, the bulk here, my picture was small, but you know, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the really the, the challenge to to um, to solve, to, to understand the spectrum of that part. And so, yeah, okay, so to, where am I going to write this? Um, okay, isotropic was uh, sort of interesting. So, um, to find m equals two eigenvectors from two onwards, we have to be smart. So far, it was just using symmetry. This was kind of the easy part, but now we have to use really kind of skill or art. And I think the best way to be smart is to listen to somebody who's smarter than you. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow beta. And this leads to something called the coordinate loop. Um, so I'm not going to really start it now because it, I won't have so much time to do it. But I can say a tiny little bit. So this is the very start of section three, coordinate. Coordinates is because we will use this coordinate basis. Right. 
Yeah, I call it the corner base because it's the one I can use for the corner base. Oh, that's that's right. the same. Beta here, and that means kind of like so. Beta was very nice. He had this sort of a physically motivated, and we'll see next time how this works. Um, he said, "Okay, let's try to find ways eigenvectors with the following form physically motivated," and then he could show that it works provided. So you're going to parameter. So really, the idea is the following. Idea is um, physically motivated. Clever parameterization of the eigenvectors. Well, of yeah, of of, of let's say would be eigenvectors. And then to show the real or true eigenvectors. If the parameter um, obey a system of equations, which are called the beta and the equations. Beta and the equation. And then you can easily, the energies are also parameterized in the same in terms of these same parameters. So the beta onset equation, so the beta onset, what it does is it reduces it the problem of diagonalizing some Hamiltonian, block by block by block, to the problem of solving some set of equations. And the reason why this is extremely nice, I mean, a priori you gain maybe not so much, but the reason why this is turns out to be extremely useful is that firstly these equations have nice structure. So you can kind of classify solutions which behave in certain ways and you can understand, and this has a physical meaning. So it really has a good physical way of parameterizing things. Um, moreover, numerically, for low enough length, you can do this, and it may be or may not be more efficient than, um, than numerical diagonalization. So at the moment, I mean, my mathematics still this is more efficient, and uh, mine are super good even for the, the numerical diagonalization. But um, so numerically, I can, you know, for a hectic thick depth, I can, if you really fix delta to a numerical value, I can maybe find all the energies numerically just by restricting to these vectors and then just asking mathematics to diagonalize. I can go up to, I don't know, maybe like 20 or something like this. So pretty good. But these base equations, certainly I cannot solve all of them for like 20, but I can, they give you much more detailed control of eigenvectors and um, they immediately allow you to read off the energy, the momentum, and kind of physically meaningful quantities, even if you didn't want to write down explicit eigenvectors. And moreover, um, which is something that I guess I will tell next time, um, is you can really nicely characterize what the ground state and the low life excitations are. So there are certain solutions to these equations, and you can really cleanly characterize them. They might be all real or have one pair of complex conjugates uh, parameters, and they have good physical meanings. And this turns out to be this is precisely what these people who compared uh, this this type of stuff to to experiments. That's what they did, and they had to solve only some of those equations, and they had very good control with the help of some numerics and so on of this stuff. Moreover. If you send the length to infinity, then rather than solving these equations, you get some integral equations and you can kind of work with uh, the densities of, of, of parameters and blah, blah, blah. And you can here really use this to compute exactly, although not rigorously, uh, energies, their finite, their leading finite size corrections, um, and then some other kind of observables that are relevant. So that's what I meant by exactly solvable. So the Heisenberg spin chain is exactly solvable because beta found a very clever way to parameterize it, eigenvectors. And this is super useful for not to understand everything about the model, but it gives an extremely good understanding of physically most important properties of the model. Uh, what time am I supposed to stop? Whenever it is a good uh, moment for you. Um, I think. I mean, the end is it's uh, elastic. Uh, Right, the end is elastic. I mean, but this is very dangerous because I can go on five hours. Uh, <laughs> I'm also elastic. <laughs> you can. Uh, if you do coordinate better than that. Is it like people are trying? No, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I think this is good. Next time I will just recap the time, but now this is the philosophy. So at least we understand the model. We have some physical intuition of this model. We understand a bit the representation theory of the model. Um, I can also, by the way, well, I can say some kind of like, I can tell you in terms of representation theory what this is, but I don't know if it's useful. I don't know. 
if you don't mind, let me let, let me take like two minutes to kind of uh, go very fast on some representation theory, which I think is super nice. If you don't understand it, it's not important. But if you do, then um, it gives a it adds a little tiny little bit more structure to the picture. Okay, so what have I actually done in terms of representation? So if you're a mathematician living at home or whatever, then what I've done is the following. I've taken my T2, which is really the first fundamental representation of SL2, single box, the so first fundamental or only fundamental representation. And I've done, performed this big tensor product H is C2 helpful tensor product. Now this setting is very important in, uh, in representation theory because well, we've already seen that on the one hand, SL2 acts on whether or not it's commuting to Hamiltonian is not a question. But now I'm not thinking about Hamiltonian, but just about the structure of the Hilbert space. So SL2 acts on here by uh, S plus minus and SZ. And um, by the way, there's also the while group which acts on here, which is just S2. And its action on the Hilbert space is precisely this spin flip operator. So this is related to my, can I call it U or V? I don't even know. Uh, it was U. U, okay, very good. So this is, this is where the representation theoretic interpretation of this U. But there's another action on this space because we just have L of identical particles. So one thing that you could do is you can permute them. Let me call this, this orange on the side. So there's also an action of the symmetric group in L generator, which just permutes the spins. So this is the action which I call T i j, swaps spin set sites i and j. And um, then sure while duality says that these two actions commute with each other, and moreover, if you want to know everything that commutes with this, you can express it in terms of T i j, and everything that commutes with these T i j's, you can express in terms of s plus minus and z. So there they generate this mutual, mutual commutant. But this is related to sure while duality, and by sure while duality, this big middle representation is extremely nice uh, decomposition as a bimodule for these simultaneously. So it is, let's say, V lambda tensor um, S strip lambda, where this V is a um, highest weight representation for SL2. And we know that they're of the form, I can just write them as, um, well, we know that they're d-dimensional. And they look like this. They look like a string of dots. Dots, 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 dots. This, and then we have s plus minus going up and down. So here it's s minus going down, s plus going up, z, x by eigenvalues. Those strings are precisely the strings that I had there. So these strings here, they're just the highest weight for SL2s. And then here, these guys are called Specht modules. Modules. They're irreducible representations of symmetric group, and they're labeled, they're labeled by standard Young tableaus. Diagrams. No, sorry, the, the basis is labeled. That's what I want to say. Excuse me. So they're labeled by this lambda, this partition, and the basis is labeled by standard Young tableau. If you know what that is. And if, in fact, we know that the dimensions, sorry, let me write this. So the dimension of this path module is, of course, the number of standard Young tableau. Is lambda, and this is L choose M minus L M minus one. Where I can so now I have to tell you what I sum over. So I'm summing over all the possible partitions of the number n such that the length of the partition is at most two. The n comes from this side and the two comes from that side. I guess I could this condition is the kind of the SL2 condition and the being a partition, so all the lambdas have to add up to n, is what it is. And concretely, what I do 
Oh, sorry, n is L. And concretely, it means that I can just write my partition like this, where the highest weight condition says that it should be lambda 1 should be larger than or equal to lambda 2. And this is this condition that m should be as small as L over 2. And so where are these spec modules in the picture? Well, in terms of just the representation theory, so now I'm going away for a moment again from the Hamiltonian. This, there's a trivial representation here. So it's one dimensional and there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here. Then we get what is called the standard representation. It is this line connecting the three red dots. It's also sitting here and another copy sitting there. And then finally, here there's another representation, which is two-dimensional, looking like this. In terms of standard Young tableau, this first part is my one, two, three, four. The next part um, is one, two, three, four, like that. And this one is called the window diagram. So you can check that the number of standard Young tableaus matches the dimensions that I was given before, like that. So this is the L choose M minus L choose M minus one. That's this length. Here, that's the dimension. Now, okay, this is all good and well, but we were interested in, interested in physics. So how much does this relate to our Hamiltonian? Well, it relates a little bit to it. So inside SL2, we have the Cartan algebra, H, which is just spanned by SZ. It also acts on here. And then, Instead, I can only look at representations of the Cartan cell algebra, which is precisely my decomposition into these weight modules, which are my horizontal lines. So um, maybe I should write this up a little bit too, so that I have a little bit more space. So in here we have Cartan, and this almost this space also decomposes in terms of H M, which I told you now I should really write L minus M comma M. Zero to L. So these are the irreducibles for this part here, which acts by S by eigenvalues. Yeah. It's a symmetric group, so it's spin permutations. It does not commute with our Hamiltonian. If I because our Hamiltonian only acts if it has nearest neighbor interpolation only. So if I can permute the spins to make them very far apart, it wouldn't interpolate. Anymore. So this clearly does not commute. So what does commute is the following. Well, we have our translation. Thing. So this is a copy of Z modulo LZ, cyclic subgroup, um, like that. But there's a little bit more because we also have parity. So this is this thing here. So it's a semi-direct product of S2. This is parity. Um, so we call this phi. And this here is G. And this together is just a dihedral group, which makes sense, right? We think of uh, well, the picture that I just erased. So we think of the chain, we look from the top now, we have all these sides, like that. And we think now of the kind of N or L gone. And all the symmetry is, well, we can either flip it like this, which was our parity, or we can rotate it like this, which was our translation. So that's the dihedral symmetries of the chain. They're just space kind of symmetries of nearest neighbor interesting Hamiltonians. And here, this was extremely nice because it's a multiplicity free decomposition. If you take into account both SL2 and the symmetric group, then there are no multiplicities. Each of these sum occurs exactly once. If you forget about the symmetric group, then this one occurs exactly dimension this many times. Whereas if you forget about the SL2, then this spec module occurs precisely dimension of this many times. Um, but if you think of them both together, then they were multiplicity free. However, if we now only restrict ourselves to the Cartan and to the dihedral subgroup, then it still decomposes, but not into multiple. There are multiplicities, namely, not for m is zero, not for m is one, because then everything was fixed by the momentum, but from m is two onward, there are states that have the same uh, energy and maybe even the same momentum, and, or sorry, not the same energy, but they have the same momentum, so we cannot just use um, the dihedral symmetry to completely decompose what we're doing. Um, there is one model, sort of a spin chain, which is really fit in this sure well type of picture. And that is this, the, the mean field model, where you just let everybody interact with each other in the same way. So what you can do is instead, you could consider the Hamiltonian, let's say, in the sum of h i j, all i length and j. Oh, maybe I should say this type of k as well. But all possible sides k in l up to l. 
this one, now we made everything completely symmetric. So now I can swap around sides as much as I want, and the Hamiltonian doesn't feel it. This is a mean field model that's kind of boring. If you think of it in terms of if you want to draw the interactions, then we don't just have nearest neighbor interactions like before, but we have also next to nearest neighbor and on, so on, and so on. So this is the complete graph. Some people like to think about Heisenberg models associated with graphs. And here we were thinking about Heisenberg's spin chain associated with just the circle graph, whereas here we are thinking of the complete graph. And in this case, the decomposition is really, these are eigenspaces of the Hamiltonian. So you immediately understand them from true wild duality. Of course, you might say it's gene field, that's a bit boring. It's also, by the way, the quadratic, it's also the quadratic Casimir in terms of SL2. Again, a little bit boring, but um, physically this is a bit relevant because in quantum computing there's this quantum computer called D-Wave, and they precisely try to engineer qubits that interact with each other all at the same time. So this is the, kind of the physical mo the, the, the model underlying that quantum computer. And moreover, since we there's extremely good control over the representation theory here, so you really understand all the energies and all the degeneracies completely and explicitly. In this case, you can really nicely do the analysis work. So you can send L to infinity, and in this case, I mean, as a physicist, you would say it's trivial, I, we understand it, but if you're more mathematical, then here you can do it rigorously. So normally, sending L to infinity is exact, maybe, but not rigorous. But here, you can really do rigorously, you can prove that for delta is this, there's such a phase, for delta is that, there's such a phase, there's a transition in between, and you can really properly prove everything. So mathematically, this is kind of nice. Um, which will occur. occur. That's a special effect, basically. So, 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 so this is the effect true for so many more uh, Hamiltonian constraints. So, whether or not beta ions are solid, that is, uh, depends on the Hamiltonian. But the representation theory, the dimensions and so on, this we can sort of understand from this picture. No, no, no. This is just the, the representation theory is the context of this picture here. And then then we go finally we just go physics. So we choose our Hamiltonian, then we have to, you know, they're not degenerate like this, so they're irrelevant. If delta is not one, then they're not degenerate according to those. So you have to forgive all these grid lines that I drew. Um, and this decomposition is useless. But at least maybe this one's useful. And then the fact that their joints, um, the, de the decomposition of the Hilbert space into bimodules for, for the part that we are symmetric under, still has multiple states. That's the takeaway. This is the, the, the mathematical version of saying this statement. But for M and 2 onward representation theory is not enough. Details will depend on the model, and we have to be smart. And perhaps if that were lucky, it's possible to do this and beta will tell us next time. Any other questions? Question? Yeah. Online, do you have a question? Just the multiplicities in the case where you reduce only the lower function. This can be obtained at some representation theoretic. Data as well, I guess, uh, evaluation of some polynomials, like in Kelsen, yes. Paper symmetry, yeah, I mean, then you have all the, the sure polynomial showing up. So the smaller symmetry group, I don't, I mean, probably, I, I have not thought about it. But it's, it's sort of the same question as how do you compute which momentum occurs how often from n equals to one? So you yeah. can. So it's kind of representation theory of this, um, you know, this group. If you picked an M, then you can kind of think of, of a group. But you don't really care about flipping the thing or translating it. So this is called the bracelet 
uh, bracelets. So the different things, things that are different, identifying translated or flipped versions are called bracelets. You can count how many there are and so on. And then you can do the combinatorics of where the down speed fit precisely. And that would give you the answer of which moment occur how often. Um, but I don't know a strict way. I don't know if, right, so I don't know. I mean, probably, probably so physically yeah, it's kind of a nice exercise to do. But yeah. uh, mathematically, I don't know if it's kind of nice enough that people have done it in detail. Maybe probably. I mean, surely it, it cannot be super hard. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. It's a, yet another way to ask the same question, to exercise the combinatorial ideas. All right. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I can ask if somebody, well, so if you have feedback, you can please let me know. If you feel uh, shy, then tell somebody else or make a fake email account and send it to me. And you can also ask any questions.